LAUSC reveals new details for getting students back in school. More on the reopening timeline and guidelines in place for in-person classes coming up. The Trojans are back in action for their second matchup of the March Madness Tournament. Our sports reporters look at the team's history and what makes it different this year. What started as a spring break hotspot is now a city with a curfew. More on the crowds and chaos happening in Southern Florida. Annenberg TV News is next. Live from USC, you're watching Annenberg TV News. LA County is one step closer to bringing students back to the classroom. Good evening, I'm Carolyn Casera reporting back on USC's campus. And I'm Lauren Hebroni, reporting right outside Wallace Annenberg Hall. LAUSD and UTLA have reached an agreement to reopen schools for in-person learning as early as April 12th. As we prepare to reopen schools as soon as possible and in the safest way possible, we're continuing to provide vaccinations for our school staff. At many schools, more than 85% of staff have already received vaccinations, are scheduled to do so, or have told us they don't wish to be vaccinated at this time. We continue to operate seven school sites, as well as SoFi Stadium at Hollywood Park, to complete the vaccination process for school staff. While LAUSD is working towards vaccinating teachers and staff, the Teachers Union agreed to a back-to-school plan. It calls for a mid-April return for kindergarten through sixth grade, and by the beginning of May, middle and high school students back at their desks. The superintendent said schools will have health practices to combat the transmission of COVID-19. There will be weekly COVID testing, students will receive and keep supplies at school, and lunches will be provided. Students are not allowed to bring lunch to school. The CDC announced on Friday that elementary school students in California now only need three feet of social distancing between them in classrooms. A mother of two young kids in Calabasas says they're both attending in-person classes. I really see, you know, the safety measures that they're putting in place and that they're, that they are like consistent with those safety measures. So they're not aspirational. They're actually implemented and working. I trust that if the CDC is coming out and saying three feet of space with a mask, you know, that's, I think an important component of it is that masks are still being asked for, um, then I am okay with it. The new rule opens up vital space in the classroom. Some schools with hybrid learning or staggered schedules will be able to accommodate more students. LAUSD Superintendent Austin Butner said no changes will be made here in Los Angeles just yet, so students will remain six feet apart. LA area K through sixth graders will be the first to return to the classroom. I'm Ella Katz reporting from Manhattan Beach. I visited one elementary school in LA County that's already back in session and students have never been so excited to get their backpacks on. Get your backpacks, you guys. There was a time when this was the most ordinary scene in America, kids heading off to school. But most public school students in LA County haven't done this for a year. See you later, Bye. have a good day. Bye. Bye. Grayson Thomas is already back in his classroom at Pennycamp Elementary. That's because Manhattan Beach Unified School District reopened on March 1st. I like it a lot better because when I'm on Zoom, I feel like my eyeballs are going to fall out of my head because I'm staring at the screen so much. My teacher could actually help me in person with my mask because at home I was struggling with it. They are so excited to just be on campus and kids get up and they get their backpacks on and they walk to school with their friends just like they used to do and they're so excited about it. Students are divided into morning and afternoon in-person sessions and have to wear masks for the entire school day. They might be separated by plexiglass but for Pennacamp students it's hard to complain. Um I really like it because I haven't seen my friends in a while um so most of my friends are in the other class, but I do have one friend that's in my class with me. So we always hang out during our like breaks and stuff and it's really nice. Coming back, we thought, okay, we're coming back and the academics are important, but really truly the social emotional wellness of students and having them interact with peers is the biggest piece that we wanna make sure that we're, we're covering here. Not everybody is back. About 15% of Manhattan Beach School District students are still at home learning online. Those numbers are expected to drop as more teachers and parents get the vaccine. For Annenberg Media, this is Ella Katz in Manhattan Beach. March Madness continues tonight with the second round matchup of the Trojans against the KU Jayhawks. 
We have our sports anchors here with us to give us more on the Trojan team and their history with the Jayhawks. The win over Drake gave the Trojans their third NCAA tournament win since 2009. If the Trojans win tonight, Coach Andy Enfield will lead for the most NCAA tournament wins of any USC basketball head coach. Looking at the series history between USC and the Jayhawks, the USC Trojans are down 5-11 to 11 with the Jayhawks leading. And I think that really tonight's game is going to be interesting because the Trojans have never really gone this far in the tournament and Evan Mobley is really holding the team down. So ultimately, I think that we have a shot. Man, I hope so, Rachel. Honestly, I need USC to pull this off in order for my bracket to be okay. I had Illinois winning it all, so I'm out. <laughs> Evan Mobley's performance thus far has really been impactful, and I'm really interested to see how he plays tonight. We're going to talk more about Evan Mobley and his performance later on in our sports broadcast. Miami Beach officials extended an emergency curfew for the next three weekends through April 12th due to spring break chaos. The curfew is from 8 p.m. to 6 a.m. Crowds gathered in Miami Beach without masks and were forced to separate by police over the weekend. Police used pepper spray balls, military vehicles arrived at the scene, and dozens of people were arrested. Spring breakers aren't glued to the television, so they may not necessarily have known that there was an 8 p.m. curfew. Here you have a group of people who traditionally come out in the evenings and they're used to rowdy partying, and then all of a sudden they're told that they need to go in and they're not being dispersed. There's also that issue between people of color being policed differently. Would that have happened had those spring breakers not been, you know, more people of color, predominantly people of color? College students from across the nation arrived in Miami Beach for spring break. Florida has milder COVID-19 restrictions and does not have a mask mandate, but Florida has surpassed 2 million COVID cases and declared a state of emergency. Yeah, I got there. Nobody's wearing masks. Um, restaurants are open. Everyone's partying. Um, there were clubs with like hundreds and hundreds of people trying to get in. Um, it didn't seem like it didn't seem like the curfew was being enforced that heavily. The other night, they completely shut down all of Miami Beach. I'm I'm living actually like right near Miami Beach. I couldn't leave my house. They totally um, they totally shut down all of the roads and there were police checkpoints checking your ID before you came onto the island or came onto the roads. You had to show proof that you lived like on Venetian or like on Miami Beach to even like to even get home. Health officials are concerned about a surge in COVID-19 cases and the spread of COVID variants nationwide as a result of spring break. Students can sleep in tomorrow as classes are canceled. It's the second scheduled wellness day of the semester. But you don't have to sleep the day away. Organizations on campus are offering all kinds of events for fun and support. I understand how much Zoom all of us have been on and maybe one extra Zoom event is not the thing that you want on the day that's called a wellness day. On the other hand, if you are, are feeling lonely or alone and need some sort of feeling of community is the event that can kind of give that to you in a certain way. It's important that we have some sort of release for the tension that we all live under that causes so much anxiety and so much depression ultimately. Laughter is the best medicine for that. I just came up with that quote. No one's ever said that before. If students are in need of a laugh, they can take the clown comedy class, practice self-care at a mindfulness workshop, or take a yoga class. Pretty much just use the day as a day to catch up with the work that was already there instead of going to the actual wellness events. I know they're focused on mental health and obviously overall physical wellness, but in general, I think the number of students that are actually utilizing them is probably lower than the university would have hoped. Tomorrow, I will be doing more work, so catching up on some group projects, um, have a few meetings for a case competition team and doing more studying for some midterms later this week. Find more on these events at calendar.usc.edu. Set the date to Tuesday the 23rd. The next wellness day is Wednesday, April 7th. After rare blood clots were linked to the AstraZeneca vaccine, a recent trial showed a 79% efficacy rate at preventing the disease symptomatically. 
Now, AstraZeneca is seeking emergency use approval from the FDA. We spoke to one medical student from Spain who says that getting vaccinated is worth it. The youngest one who get uh, vacuumed were like not very wor worried about um, the possible effects. I think uh, it's worthwhile to be like a week with a little bit of illness. If with that we can save like all the situation. Reports of blood clotting and hospitalizations from AstraZeneca have created controversies over the vaccine. Some European countries have even stopped using AstraZeneca. A UCLA professor emphasized the effectiveness of this vaccine. In this latest AstraZeneca trial, they did not find any cases. They also found this in Pfizer and Moderna's uh, data as well. The vaccine does prevent hospitalizations and deaths. More choices um, give people um, more access to vaccines because not everybody has access to a vaccine now. The vaccine also proved a 100% effective rate at preventing severe hospitalizations. Once approved, AstraZeneca will be the fourth available vaccine in the U.S., along with Moderna, Pfizer, and Johnson & Johnson. Facilities at the Mexico-U.S. border have been overrun with people trying to come into the country. Compounding this problem, thousands of unaccompanied immigrant children are now in government shelters across the border. Um, we've got to treat this issue in a way that is reflective of our values as Americans and do it in a way that is fair and it is humane. To that end, the House of Representatives has been busy on immigration, reinstating much of the Dreamers Act and another bill creating a new path to citizenship for immigrant farmers. What do you do when you have certain conditions in other countries that are causing people to come to our border and we have certain international obligations to abide by? You can't just break the law and turn everybody away. Uh, you have to do it in a, in a manner. And so I think that's what a better system needs to be set up. And so perhaps these laws, the legislation, will work towards establishing a better immigration system overall. The two bills now head to the Senate for a vote. President Biden has already said he supports both. Happy Monday, everyone. The Trojans have advanced to round two of March Madness. Freshman forward Evan Mobley has definitely been making his impact this tournament season. Mobley is playing his biggest ball in the biggest games, averaging 23 points, 9 rebounds, and 4 blocks between the Pac-12 and NCAA tournaments. Looking ahead, Mobley is expected to lead the Trojans with his killer defense in the game against Kansas this evening as he looks to continue to build his already high NBA draft stock. In college, there's a lot more details that goes into defense and um, in high school, so I really just uh, used what the coach taught me. Uh, stay down. Uh, that was probably my biggest thing I learned because um, I, I, I get jumpy sometimes, but uh, I just try to stay down and uh, contest the shot, if, I, if not block it. If USC wants to advance deep into the NCAA, they're going to need Evan Mobley to continue his defensive dominance as a top three pick. Now for more sports, let's head over to Bianca. Thanks, Rach. UCLA men's water polo are now the NCAA Division I champions. USC men's water polo fell to the Bruins in the NCAA Division I Championships at home Sunday in a nail-biting 7-6 loss as SC missed the chance to take the game to overtime. In SC's 15th NCAA Championship appearance in the past 16 seasons, the Trojans trailed 3-0 at halftime before turning it on with four goals in the third period. Down by one in the fourth, USC looked to force overtime with 19 seconds left, but the shot clipped the crossbar and the Bruins secured the victory. Sad news today for the Laker family and fans. Hall of Famer forward Elgin Baylor passed away today. The NBA legend died of natural causes. Baylor was an 11-time All-Star and made eight NBA Finals appearances. In the 1962 Finals against the Celtics in the epic East-West rivalry, Baylor set the single-game final scoring record with 61 points. After his playing career, Baylor was the Clippers general manager from 1986 to 2009 and was named the NBA Executive of the Year in 2006. Baylor was 86 years old. Good evening, Trojans. Welcome back to Trojans Around the Globe. I'm Jennifer Kim reporting from San Francisco, California. 
Today, we meet Torres Chi, who despite facing challenges attending USC from Shanghai, China, found new opportunities like his new internship to make his time during COVID worthwhile. I can have access to all the resources, all the you know, food from all over the world. I can enjoy very great uh, public transportation, very great uh, libraries or government institutions. Yeah, that's what I enjoy most. This semester, I got 40 or 50 textbooks and uh, many of them are you know not are not available in China so I have to pay a lot a very high uh, fee to get them from Amazon to China and uh, that will take like three weeks or two weeks that's kind of inconvenient yeah. I was a content producer for a very popular show that's a merit of uh, COVID-19 because like I could have a lot of time to you know stay in China and find jobs I like while uh, attending lectures. In honor of Women's History Month, we are highlighting women who inspire us. Annenberg Media's Taylor Milner shares with us how her grandmother supports her in everything Taylor does, from starting a business to grad school. My Nana is the superwoman in my life. She's the ultimate survivor. Her mother died when she was five years old. Her dad was an alcoholic and she had my mother at 16 years old. But I always tell her she had my mother young so that she can have a good relationship with me. She taught me the importance of having options because she had such few choices as a teenage mother. And she's helped me every step along the way. She was the first person I told when I got into grad school. She's the person that presses the button on the teleprompter when I need to shoot. I started a business making server books for waiters and restaurants. She tracks inventory in the living room. She helped me study for my real estate test. I've been an actor since the age of three, and she even reads lines with me before auditions. Every young woman needs a superwoman in their life. If I could be anything like my Nana, I would consider my life a success. Wow, Lauren, I absolutely adored that story. I can only imagine having a woman as strong as Taylor's Nana in my life. I also absolutely adored how she referred to her as being a survivor because that's exactly what she is. Same here. I just love how much she supported her in her academic career and then also clicking the record button for her whenever she wants to record and keeping inventory for her entrepreneurial venture. They've just been able to accomplish so much with each other's support. I seriously need someone like Taylor's Nana cheering me on through midterms these days. Don't we all? <laughs> Well, that's it for Annenberg TV News. Thank you so much for watching. For everyone at Annenberg Media, have a great night.